Good morning. Shalom it's, from somewhere in Krakow. <laughs> this is AMA number 77? 78, 78, sorry. This is AMA number 78. Today is Thursday, December 16th, 2021, also known as? The 12th day of Tevet, 5782. Exactly. Good one. Exactly. Excellent date. One of our top 365 days of the Jewish calendar today. Rabbi Avi, I am coming to you from the JCC office headquarters broadcast, JCC broadcast center. And Rabbi Avi is in parts unknown on a secret mission in the dark. <laughs> I am on a mission here trying to find my way home, weaving my way through Staramiasto, trying to find uh, a way to get home in the holiday season traffic. Eat i be deep in enemy territory, I see. I see checkpoints, I see cars, I see uh, soldiers with guns. Where are you, Rabbi Avi? I'm, I'm behind, I don't know if you can see it, I'm behind a trolley that says 613. So that's a sign from God that uh, number 613 is in front of me. That, of course, is the mitzvot in the Torah. So, Avi, is it, true, is it true that you have been, you, you were sitting at home in Efrat and saw a license, a car with a license plate 613 and have just been following it for days? <laughs> I, I will neither confirm nor deny. No, look at Rabbi Avi. Uh, his flight, strangely enough, shockingly, Ryanair flight was a little late. And uh, Avi, in his impeccable timing, a little late for the AMA, but being the trooper that he is, AMA from the taxi. From the taxi, me and my good uh, taxi driver, um, Kitrit, I think his name is, I'm not sure. But um, we are making our way there. We'll be there in a few minutes. But I have to tell you, I've been traveling, you know, eight years every single week and during COVID as well. And one thing I knew for sure was with my COVID certificate, I'm three times uh, boosted in everything that you need. I have no problems at the border until today. For the first time, they asked to see my COVID test in addition to my vaccination. I said, what? What are you talking about? They said, yes, it's the rule. You need a COVID test. If you don't have a COVID test, you need to go to quarantine. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm, I'm only here for five days. <laughs> How can I quarantine? He said, I'm sorry. This is what you must do. <clears throat> just, and it is, it is, just say yes. It is here where I invoke the holy name. I said, Michael Shudrich is the chief rabbi. I work for Rabbi Michael Shudrich. He's got to have some weight here at the, at the uh, terminal. So uh, when he heard that I worked for Rabbi Shudrich, he said it's up two weeks of quarantine. No, no, he said, he said, all right, this is your last warning. And he let me come through. Really? Yes. You know, interesting, Rabbi Shudrich, I'm in a, I actually am planning on going to the movies going to the movies today and I don't have a ticket, but I am planning on saying that I, uh, I'm very close friends with Rabbi Shudrick and seeing if it gets me a seat. Hey, whatever works. I'm right now uh, at the Chabad Synagogue. They're the beautiful windows of what used to be the bank. And um, hopefully there are no beggars oh, there. This is like a little travelogue, a dark travelogue yeah. of dark post-apocalyptic Krakow. Dikla and Sebastiana. So, uh, so you will see me in person in very, very the shortly. The gate should be open. In. I'm sure Seb has the gate open. Uh, it's told the guy the gate should be open as Avi pulls up to the JCC. The gate is open and we'll do your miraculous. I want you to run through the building on camera and sit uh, in the uh, place waiting uh, for you. Of course I will run through the building. Absolutely. Avi, uh, it's interesting stuff going on this week. Uh, I got a TV, Avi. Whoa, I am coming over. That's exciting. How big? Well, 65, first of all, uh, you know, that's not a question that we in polite company ask, but since you did ask, <laughs> I, mean, I understand, I understand that it's the uh, quality of this matrix of the screen, not the size of the screen that matters. But since you did indiscreetly ask, I will, uh, I will admit to, I will admit to having a 65 inch television. Wow. I am on the Adobe street. This is very exciting. Yes, Dale, Dale. 
Brahma Jalona, a po po some of two tie. I just want to greet our friends, Benji. There is no one at the gate. TV Chadesh, the gate should be open. Oh, okay, okay. TV, uh, Benji, hi, Benji. Excited about our TV. Saul Schachter, 60 degrees in Seacliff today. Amazing. And 54 in Toronto. Heat wave. Don't tell you more. Says no. Buzz, 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 buzz. Rabbi Avi, as you pull, so. I banged into the gate. Uh, ah! uh, Avi coming in. So Avi, I got a TV, uh, but don't get too excited about coming over to watch. One, it's in the bedroom where we like to watch TV oh, when we go to bed. Well, that's also, awkward. It's not actually hooked up to any TV aspect. So it's, we're, you know, I have different streaming things that I have on my laptop. So instead of watching Netflix and HBO and all of these things that I watch on my laptop, we will now be able to watch them at night on the computer, on the television. Very exciting. I see Frida. Who got Avi, my workout for today? Taking the stairs, Avi. Look at you. Oh, the trusty Seb to help me out. Oh, I've never worked so hard for an AMA. And he makes it. Avi is very dramatic. <laughs> very dramatic, Avi. Oh, wait, I hope this, is the computer on? Let's see. Yeah. Oh, look. Right, shut the other one. Wait, you see me twice. Yeah, it's twice. It's two times too many. Shut the, <laughs> shut the phone up. There we go. Welcome, welcome, Ava. You know what? I got to give you a hug. I'm breaking all kinds of protocol. <laughs> breaking all kinds of protocol. Good to see you. Good to see you, man. Good to be here. Ah, I'm spitzing. Wow. But I think I, I like this. This was, this, it was, this is like some kind of like Hunger Games type competition to get you to the JCC. Welcome. Thank you very much. It was definitely... An experience? I mean, I, the question is, after going up two flights of steps, are you going to be out of breath the entire AMA or just a few minutes? I was carrying stuff. I was swept away. Uh, give me, <laughs> you have to rid me right away. I'm just in shock. Okay, okay. So besides the television, which is news, uh, and you getting here, which is news, uh, we have something that we, we was very exciting for us this week, which was, Steph Curry beat Ray Allen's all-time three-point record. I have to tell you, I watched it over and over and over again. I mean, I watched the Indiana Pacers game, and there was that last second shot that would have been just the crowning icing on the cake because he also was going for the record of the most three-pointers. Three he missed that one, but in Madison Square Garden, that's not a bad way to go. Do it in the garden. I haven't watched it yet. But of course, for us, we're, we, we're, vet, we're interested, we're a particularly interested party because he beat great friend of the JCC, great friend of the Jewish uh, community, advocate for Holocaust survivors and for Holocaust memory, ride for the living, uh, ride for the living, hopeful participant, Mr. NBA uh, three point until this, Mr. Mensch of the NBA, Ray Allen. Yeah, you know, it's one, one mensch who takes the record of another mensch because the humility that uh, Steph Perry uh, expresses is, uh, is really uh, amazing. Uh, I watch him all the time. Ray and Allen, I great, Ray Allen, great friend of the Jewish people. And Ray, uh, sorry, St Ray Allen, great friend of the Jewish people. And Steph Curry, great man with Hebrew tattoos. Well, how do you think he broke the record? He had the help, a little bit of help. He really does. You know, they do this all the time. You know, they're, they're always, you know, they're religious personalities. And you know what? In sports, sometimes uh, they're not the best role models. So when we have one who is, we should. Uh, I'll tell you what, spending a little bit of time, not that I'm, you know, close friends, but having spent time on a few occasions with Ray Allen and having gone to his house uh, in Florida and have met the family and his wife. They are couldn't be nicer, more humble people. You know, he's uh, coaching high school basketball right now, Ray Allen. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. 
So it was nice to see him in the news all the time now and people focusing on him with the with the record and what you know he, the the thing about Ray Allen is that everybody talks about that he's a very OCD you know he's a very conditioned person he's amazing in many ways but very OCD in terms of repeating things and repeating things and that's how you get to be such a good shooter you have to do the same motion a million times It was amazing I remember seeing him with his whole family and just the way that he raised kids and and the whole family together and and when they take on something that's really, you know, a little foreign uh, and they all kind of get behind it in Poland and Krakow and Auschwitz uh, and then ride for the living, Ray Allen is a super, super guy. And I bet if we, uh, if we find a way to get to Steph Curry, maybe he'll join us on the bus ride too. I think we could have a little competition, Steph Curry and Ray Allen, who would, uh, I think they'd, they'd finish in about 45 minutes each considering how competitive they are. Yeah, I mean, Steph Curry did, you know, get 2000, uh, you know, 2974, but he hasn't been involved in the, in the ride. So he, they're, you know, they're neck and neck in my book. That's true. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Uh, anyway, what's going on in Israel is um, countries suffering in terms of, you know, the new government in the old government, they put a lockdown. Basically, people couldn't leave their house. So, you know, it was during the, the height of Corona and the second wave. The new government said, we're never, ever, ever going to do that, which is true. But they, um, they're locking down the skies, they're locking down the tourism. And now they're trying to push that the malls, you have to wear a, a tag that says you've been vaccinated. Two million Israelis are anti-vaccine. So, it's a struggle with the 9 million Two million population. Israelis are anti-vaccine? Two million Israelis have not had any vaccine. What, is the, po- what, is, the, what is the Haredi and Arab population of Israel? I, I'd say three, uh, two, two and a half million. I, I, don't know. I don't know. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering how much of that population is the ultra-Orthodox they, they and Arab. I don't know if I could generalize that way. I, I think that the numbers are worse, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's it's there. I think it's an older segment of the population that is not doing it. And the prime minister is trying to find a way. How can we do this? You know, is it a carrot? Is it a stick? Um, so they're cutting off, you know, uh, countries one by one. I don't know if by the end of my trip, Poland will be, will be a red country or, or not. And if it's a red country, then there's a whole new protocol that's involved. Complicated. Um, I, I did hear an interesting thing about uh, England. You know, the I think they had seventy thousand new cases yesterday of, uh, of Corona, which is just unbelievable. And everyone's talking about Omicron, right? Um, so they're saying that this is the fastest most contagious variant, but they'll know in a week if it's um, only affecting the upper area of the chest rather than the lower area. And if it really only affects the upper area, even the chest, you know, the throat, it's it's basically like a flu. If If it's lower down, then it actually could be the salvation of corona. So if it's down, it could be the worst killing part of Corona that, that we've seen so far. And if it is a lowered strain somehow in terms of its capacity to, uh, to cause damage, then maybe uh, everyone gets it and then it kind of just fly, fizzles out. So that's what I just heard from the report. Very interesting, uh, very interesting. In Poland, they're also tightening things a little bit um, here. Uh, it says, my update, which you didn't get, People arriving to Poland outside the Schengen area required to perform the COVID-19 test no earlier than 24 hours before crossing the border. Interesting that I have the memo and you don't, Rabbi Avi. Uh, And they're just closing discos and clubs, uh, closing discos. I don't think that'll affect people very much unless we go back to 1978. But uh, cinemas, sports facilities, in terms of how many people you can have in there have all changed. Um, But uh, lots of interesting stuff going. Rabbi Avi, I'm very excited for today's guest. Should I introduce uh, today's guest or would you like to introduce today's guest? You, by all means, this is your deal. You started, you go, you continue. I, 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 I'm very happy to introduce today's guest because you know, today you, this is a friend, uh, your friend. So we're very excited today to have Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs 
um, who has been involved in many things in his career. He's an es expert on uh, Agnon. He runs tours to Ukraine uh, and Poland. He's the founder, director, founding director of Atid, which is the Academy for Torah Initiatives and Directions in Jewish Education, and it's webyeshiva.org, that program. He's also an editor of the journal Tradition, the series editor of the SOI Agnon Library at the Toby Press, and director of research at the Agnon House in Jerusalem, and a consulting editor of Lair House. A triple, and this is a triple. This is like, I think this for in our NBA context, this is like an NBA champion, a college champion. Yeah, I forgot some champion. of those things. This is a, a three-time graduate of Yeshiva University, BA, MA, and Smicha, and was a Jerusalem fellow at the Mandel Leadership Institute and many, many other, many other uh, things. It's a uh, very long, if we, I would spend the whole time reading his very impressive biography. Great to have you with us, Rabbi nice Jonathan. Nice to Pat. see you, Jonathan Ornstein and Avi Baumel. How are and things in Brecon? Nice guy. You forgot to mention that. Nice. Of guy. course, he's a nice guy. We wouldn't have him on if he wasn't a nice guy. <laughs> Thank you, nice Rabbi Sachs, for you, joining us. Thank you, Rabbi Bamel. Are you uh, in the old country or here here at home? Uh, I'm, I I uh, six hours ago was in Israel, and now I'm sitting at JCC. Mm -hmm. uh, the miracle of modern uh, transportation, although uh, it was a bit daunting this time around. I made it here. I'm actually five feet away from Jonathan, um, and uh, I'll be here for Shabbos, you know, doing my thing. That's great. Rabbi Sachs, are you in your in your study? I've never seen this uh, room. That's I, I'm in my home. This is a, one of those fake Zoom backgrounds. It's Agnon's library. In oh. Okay. I was gonna. Yeah. I was okay. I'm. I was. I was a little intimidated by the, the, the by all the books behind you. I have to say. Right. Agnon's library. So we want to talk about we want to talk about uh, you know many things in Agnon and, and and different aspects of what how you see the especially modern Orthodox life in Israel and and in the U.S. today. But I want to start maybe go a little chronologically. So and I understand you grew up in a non-observant home and found your way to modern Orthodoxy. And I grew up in a modern Orthodox uh, home. We, and found, we passed each other. We passed each other moving in different directions in the doorway. Exactly. I found my way in, in whatever whatever it is that I am, which I don't know. But mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit, tell us a little bit about that, about that that path. To, because I, I think that often people grow up, uh, if they grow up sort of in a more secular background and then they become religious, they usually I think very maybe become more extreme in certain ways, but I'm interested in your path going from from uh, less observant to a modern Orthodox. Uh. Oh. That's really it's a it's an interesting question because just yesterday I was talking with someone that works with us who originally comes from from Poland and uh, and I was talking about something which actually intersects very much with I guess with my own biography that you asked about, but also I think with some of your work and some of what's going on in Jewish life in Poland, at least as I understand it from my couple of visits that I've, that I've made. And, and I would just say parenthetically here, I, I have to get back. It's been, a, it's been a while and I had plans to come and then, you know, Corona. Um, and, uh, but particularly on my last visit, uh, when I spoke at the JCC, um, I, I said to someone after everything you need to understand about what Jonathan and Avi are doing there is is all expressed in you know this kind of this color green you know neon electric uh, lime lime green in my imagination the first time i i came to poland uh, and i only you know started visiting as an adult the first time i came to poland in my imagination it, it was all black and white it all looked like something out of a roman vishniak picture and you get there and you realize that, you know, that's not exactly the way it is, but only when you get to Krakow and you walk in and you see that color green, I immediately understood what you, what your whole design ethos was, right? It, it broadcasts in the loudest possible manner. We are alive. We are, we are doing something dynamic here. You know, this is not your granddaddy's Judaism, and it's not it's not a Roman Vishniak uh, uh, picture. And and frankly, neither it is. Is it, you know, just some kind of, you know, giving a, a proper burial to a Judaism that once was. This is about the here and now and the future. And, and I've said to many people after that visit, everything you need to understand about what these guys are doing there is represented in that in that color. But in terms of your question, I, I like you, question. like you said, I grew up in a, in a, a non-observant home. 
a Jewish home, uh, but a non-observant home, uh, all of my grandparents and most of my great-grandparents were born in the United States. That's pretty unusual for someone, you know, let's say our generation. Um, most of my, and all of my grand, great-grandparents that were immigrants had arrived in the United States, you know, around or before 1900. So my grandparents who had, you know, Jewish identity, they grew up in neighborhoods in, in, in Brooklyn and in New York, surrounded by Jews just like them, but they weren't observant. My grandparents didn't keep kosher homes. They didn't speak Yiddish, right? I didn't have that kind of Bobby and Zaidi that other people had. I think most people our generation have at least one European born uh, grand, grandparent. And therefore, it was kind of tabula rasa. I mean, we had traditions, we had, uh, you know, Hanukkah candles and, you know, a Passover Seder of, of, some, of some variety, but uh, it wasn't the kind of engaged Jewish life, Orthodox or otherwise, um, you know, that, you know that, that the three of us are, are familiar with both from our youth and, and from our current existences. In high school, uh, largely through the influence of a particularly a loving and special rabbi, Rabbi Stephen Dworkin, Zichron Olavracha, of Linden, New Jersey, the town that I grew up in, and through the youth movement NCSY, which was connected to his, his shul, I started becoming interested. It was an Orthodox shul, the kind of which you don't, tragically, you don't have as much as, uh, as you used to. It was an Orthodox shul with a almost completely non-Orthodox congregation. Um, you know, people, people drove, they parked their car around the corner. Uh, don't ask, don't tell. Uh, everybody had a, a kind of yarmulke with a, with a, like a crease in it, you know, from you know, <laughs> in, their, in their pocket and they, they, they take it out and it would sit on their head, you know, and look something, <laughs> something like that. Um, and it was an aging or already aged congregation. There were very few kids you know, my age, besides the rabbi's children, and really only one or two other families. But yet I became very interested in, in Jewish things for a whole variety of, of reasons. And over the course of high school, I became much more uh, committed and, uh, and, and observant, um, uh, uh, Sabbath observant. My parents, who, you know, are just the most wonderful people and extremely accommodating of their children, um, made our house kosher, and they themselves became much more Jewishly engaged, although not, not Orthodox. And then after high school, I made a decision to go to Yeshiva University, uh, where I think Avi and I first met um, uh, to study. They had a program you know, for, for young men such as myself that were coming from uh, less learned backgrounds. Um, and I kind of, uh, you know, caught up rather quickly. For many years, I, I thought it was because, well, it just must mean that I'm very brilliant. But then I discovered, no, it's, it's just that most kids that had gone to Yeshiva Day School don't learn all that much. So filling in the gap wasn't quite as great as I, as I imagined. And uh, in my second year of college, I came here to Israel to study in the Bravinder's Yeshiva, Rabbi Chaim Bravinder's Yeshiva. Uh, and then went back to yeshiva and uh, finished my degree and an MA and, you know, all those other things on my CV that you mentioned. And that was, you know, part of my process. But the question of why modern orthodoxy and not, you know, some kind of Haredi or ultra-orthodox variety, which I think you're correct, many Baalei Tshuva, you know, do take that path. Well, part of it is I, I wasn't exposed to it. All of my role models were, you know, of the modern orthodox variety. And that kind of, I think really that created a kind of permission structure for me because I don't think I was ready to go in, you know, whole hog and renounce, you know, all of worldly wisdom and general learning and literature and other interests that I had. And it was actually quite, um, it, it really is what helped my parents kind of get used to the idea. You know, when they understood, they thought you'd become, you know, like that, you know, that scene in Annie Hall where, where, you know, Woody Allen goes to Annie's, you know, the most waspy white bread and mayonnaise family. And he's, Woody Allen is sitting there. He's just like a regular New York, you know, assimilated Jew. But when you see him through their eyes, he's got the payas and the black hat <laughs> and the beard and the things like that. And I think that's what my parents were, were afraid of, 
that I was going to go off some deep end. And I think once they realized that, no, I was going to be the same person. I was going to have the same sense of humor. I was going to have the same interests and hobbies. I was going to continue to pursue my education and my career. They, they didn't yet know I was going to go the rabbi path. I was headed to law school at that point. Um, and Torah saved Jeff, me. I don't want to deep dive too much. It's maybe one line in NCSY, this uh, youth program, which I also you know, frequented. Um, you say that your experience of staying modern Orthodox was, was normal or, or, and today I think they're going a little right to the right rather than towing yeah. the line. <laughs> in, uh, in New Jersey NCSY, where I was involved, you were involved uh, in New York. Um, but in New Jersey NCSY, most of the, you know, in my day in the 1980s, uh, most of the, really most of the, the, the advisors, the youth leaders were, you know, the really outstanding figures from the YU Beit Midrash, the Yeshiva University Beit Midrash, who really were, you know, modern Orthodox, you know, with a standard deviation on, on either side. I think that in other areas of the country, the youth movement really was led more by people from the yeshivish world, the right wing world, and, and probably had a different effect. But most of my friends, not all, but most of my friends, you know, who became observant through NCSY are, you know, today remain modern Orthodox, I guess, with a standard deviation on, on either end. Some people who didn't stick with it and other people that, you know, were exposed to other influences at different points elsewhere and, you know, went more, more to the right. But I'll say that the interesting thing is, uh, and this plays back into what I was saying about Poland, you know, when I came to Poland, you meet all types of people. And as the two of you know, everybody in Poland, every, every Jewishly observant Pole has some kind of story. And each story is sometimes more unbelievable than the next. There is, by this time in your careers, I'm sure there is nothing that shocks you. But, you know, you encounter, you encounter these, these, these observant Jews in Warsaw and Łódź and Krakow and other places where I traveled around. They, they really do look like they walked out of the Roman Vishniak picture. They look like Belze Hasidim. It looks, they would look perfect. They would fit in perfectly normally into B'nai Brak or Mea Sharon here. They can't and, just, and not only that, but, you know, two years earlier, they didn't even know they were Jewish. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, so, everybody so has a story like this. It was giving, and, and but, the, but when they do discover their Jewish roots and they do return to, to observance, they don't become, they, they, they have this, almost compulsion for many of them to kind of discover where this chain was broken. And the last time their great grandfather, their great, great grandfather was Jewishly engaged. That's the way they looked. That's the way they dressed. Everyone in Warsaw uh, dressed like that in, in 1920. And therefore they feel this compulsion to kind of pick it up where it was left off. I didn't feel that. But right? I didn't, you know, I have no idea when and where the last person in my family was, 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 was Orthodox. Um, you, make very, you make a very interesting point. And also, I, I think that when people are coming to it, it's a very different, even the idea of being a Baal Tshuva um, is different when you grew up without knowing you're Jewish. So, you know, whether you had to go through conversion or you didn't, if it happens to be on the mother's side in Poland or not, then it makes life much easier, obviously, if it's the mother's side. But um Coming to it from the outside, it's almost like you have to, you, you, the more, the, there's a, a clear idea in Poland, which, of course, I don't think any of us would agree with, that the more observant you are, the more Jewish you are. And they're trying to distance themselves from a past that was not their own choosing. Right, and right, they, so they, by, they, by not choosing something which is a somewhat more nuanced, modern, orthodox, traditional, this, but part of this, that's not generally the choice that's made. Right. I'll yeah, tell you a great story. Yeah, the last, know. last, the last time I was there, I was in in Warsaw, and our mutual, uh, our mutual friend and and teacher and fearless leader of Michael Shudrich, uh, your chief rabbi, uh, had me give a shiur in in the in the shul in Warsaw, and I taught whatever I taught, and you know it was being translated, uh, you know, which is always a, a you know a, an unsettling experience because you know you speak for 90 seconds and then the translator speaks for four minutes and they're like having a whole conversation 
going on? <laughs> like, what do you what do you say? After there's this one fellow also with the whole garb, the whole thing, you know, whole hog. Well, probably not hog, you know, it's not so kosher, but uh, sitting in the front, you know, black hat, the long coat, the whole thing. He is sitting with rapt attention, drinking in every word that I'm saying, listening between me and the translator. Now, you know, I have a lot of confidence in my abilities as a teacher, and I've been at this a long time, and I know when I'm teaching well and when I'm not. And it was a, let's say it was a perfectly fine class, but I couldn't understand what this, what this fellow was, was staring at. Afterwards, he, he comes up to me, he says, Rabbi, I want you to know, was the best cure I ever heard in my life. It changed my life this year, what you said. I was, I was so flattered. I was so, I was so impressed with myself that I'd had this effect on, the, on this man. Afterwards, Michael says to me, Jeff, indeed, it was a very good shiur. But you have to understand when he says it was the most important shiur he's ever heard in his life, two months ago, he didn't know he was Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to put it into context. Rabbi Sachs, you, uh, you made Aliyah uh, 25 years ago? Yeah, a little more already, 94. Yeah. So uh, let, let's talk about something that, you know, in the culture in, in Israel, and, you know, some people are trying to push it in there, but the, the idea of modern orthodoxy in Israel that's a, that's, that's a foreign concept, uh, and it doesn't really translate into religious Zionists, especially with all the political uh, connotations. So how would you, you know, gauge that? Uh, is, is the value, the values of, of what modern orthodox stand for, can they be applied to Israel? Does it matter? Do we just move on? Yeah. Well, well, in other words, that's part of a larger conversation about the state of modern orthodoxy in the United States and elsewhere as well. After all, modern orthodoxy of our youth is not exactly what's going on in America today. You could point to a kind of set of common core values, and I guess we could rate whether they're doing, you know, better or worse than they were, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and then you could try to compare that to what's going on in Israel. You're, you're right to observe that the religious Zionist community here, you know, the community that you and I and most of our, our neighbors uh, here in Efrat uh, belong to um, the religious Zionist or Dati Lumi world, it overlaps with many of the features of what's classically considered American modern orthodoxy, but it is not identical. And, and it's good that it's not identical, right? You different communities, different nations, different concerns, different realities. You need religious communities that are responsive to, to uh, you know, to the, to the facts on the ground. But modern orthodoxy, you know, in some ways ha has never been better, has never been stronger. I think we all, no matter how we voted uh, in the ballot box, well, I, we, we went to the ballot box quite frequently in the last few years, but, uh, but no matter how we voted in the ballot box, Israel, I think we can take pride, you know, in the fact that there's a, a, a religious Jew sitting in the prime minister's office. Whether you agree with his policies, you disagree with his policies, you think it's going in a good direction, you vote for him again. There's something significant that after, you know, 75, however many years of the state of Israel, there's a religious Jew sitting in the prime minister's office. Uh, he wears and no one really talks about it, which I think yeah. is great. And it, it's right, and it's almost, it's almost ancillary to, to what he's doing. As a matter of fact, he's being clobbered by members of his own religious community uh, today for, you know, for certain uh, directions and certain policies. Um, but that's part of the uh, finessing a very, very um, delicate coalition. So modern, okay. modern, orthodox, modern orthodoxy to me, you know, as a bit obviously an outsider to it compared to the two of you, um, it represents a certain compromise that it seems like the world is not in a very compromising mode, whether it's politics or religion. And I feel like things, if you look at, for example, the conservative movement in the United States, which is, is, is really, um, you know, I think there are certain very strong synagogues that we work with, but overall, I think there's a feeling that the numbers are definitely not what they would like it to be. Right. So, 
you know, I, I wonder how modern orthodoxy is able to maintain its relevance when you generally have a, a people that are, are, are generally find people becoming more extreme in, in the way maybe through social media, the way that the world works nowadays amplifies the loudest voices and very often the loudest voices in any subject are not going to be the voices in the middle. They're going to be the more extreme, whether that is anti, much more anti-religion or much more, um, you know, much more observant. Well, that's, that's a really good point that you make, although I would disagree with your use of the term compromise. I don't think modern orthodoxy is about compromise. Um, you know, certainly if you look to Rabbi Soloveitchik, Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, you know, who, you know, who's kind of like the, uh, the, the granddaddy of, of modern orthodoxy, the philosophical, the philosophical uh, high priest of, of modern orthodoxy, even though he had critiques on the community that called itself modern orthodoxy. Um, he, he doesn't speak about this as a compromise. Quite the contrary. If you read, let's say, the beginning of his, you know, most, maybe perhaps, you know, most autobiographical and among his most important essays, The Lonely Man of Faith, which first appeared in, in the journal that I edit in tradition, he projects a kind of self-confidence that there's nothing out there in the world, not in science, not in history, not in psychology, uh, not, in, not even in biblical criticism that's threatening to faith. Faith is something that has to be earned. There's no doubt about that. We live in a modern world. The old model, which may never have actually been true, but the old model of you know, people kind of absorbing faith like so much mother's milk uh, is is not is not the case. It's something that we have to strive for. There can no longer be anything as kind of simple faith. Again, even if there really was such a thing, or perhaps it's just some kind of nostalgic, uh, nostalgic uh, notion. But that idea that there's nothing to be afraid of. It's something that I've tried very hard to always communicate to my children. Right? There's nothing in science to be afraid of. Right? There's nothing. You know, there are things that may appear to be threatening or contradictory or ideas, but there's nothing, there's nothing to be, he, Rabbi Soloveitchik lists a whole variety of things in that he's writing in the mid 20th century. And he, he catalogs all the things that were considered to be like the, the monkey wrenches in the works of faith, things like historicism, things like, he's probably talking about Freudian psychology, which, you know, had a particular way of looking at religion. He's looking at Darwin, He's looking at biblical criticism. He says, I've never lost a minute's sleep over these things. Right? So, I mean, I guess. Uh, and, and that, but that idea is not a compromise. I'm sorry. It's, it's just, it's not a compromise. It's a, it's a kind of synthetic view of the world that we can have this and that, right? We can, we can have faith and science. We can have faith and, and modernity. We can find a way. There'll be bumps along the road. You have yeah. to figure out a way to, to, to resolve, you know, the seeming contradictions but we can do that. And in that regard, I think it really is quite strong. But what really is dangerous is, is what you mentioned, the kind of cheapening of all of all dialogue and 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 rhetoric. Everything you know becomes a tweet and a sound bite. And the challenge of modern orthodoxy always was that it requires a certain level of intellectual engagement. You have to really be thinking really hard. And that's always been an educational challenge because not everyone is a little philosopher king, right? There, there is an important role for, you know, let's say the old model of the simple, you know, the Yehudiya Pashut, the simple, the simple Jew, right? Who's not reading philosophical texts. Uh, that's a very serious challenge. There's a high bar that we set, but in a world which requires nuance and sophistication and, and things like that, we live in a world where those are, hard commodities to come by because uh, because of the, the nature. And that's, and that's what happens to discussion. And that's what happens to, uh, you know, engagement with people that don't think like us. Everything becomes, everything gets reduced to a, to a, a comment in a Facebook thread. And that's really dangerous to all branches of, of Judaism. These are things that Avi and I discuss uh, a lot and have discussed a lot over the years. And I think that you know, from, from a sort of very basic point of view, the Haredi world, there is a more, and again, it's not to, not to paint it as more homogenous than, than it is, because it, of course it isn't, but this idea, which is saying there are certain rules, we, 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 we the rules of the world in, in terms of men, men and women's roles and things like that are somewhat consistent with the way that 
prayer is run and the way that, that there, you know, there, there's a, there's an easier aspect to the world. In other words, men are in charge of certain things and men are allowed to do certain things and men have certain privileges. And that is, is, is kind of holistic in their world with no separation between the synagogue and outside the synagogue. And in the reform world or in the secular world or in, in, in less observant than, you know, than, than, than modern Orthodox, let's say, then it's an idea that women can be full participants in every aspect of life and also in synagogue observers. Uh, but modern Orthodox is a little more complicated because on some level you can have, uh, you know, you have the husband who can be not doing too much and the wife can be the leading brain surgeon on the planet, but inside the synagogue, he has certain privileges that she doesn't. And it's a little bit anachronistic in a certain way or could be seen, I don't want to say it is, but could be seen as something that's a little more difficult to shoehorn into into today's world with these things because because of because of that nature whereas you don't have those conflicts in 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 other parts of, of judaism other right. denominations maybe although you've already pointed out the irony that in the denominations where women can be full partners by and large i mean those that show up can be full fully active uh, equal equal to to their husbands but by and large they're not showing up Right. right. So, in other so words, there are more opportunities, and there are fewer and fewer Jews each year taking advantage of those opportunities in the more liberal denominations. Right. And in the modern Orthodox world, at least, well, you know, we're struggling with these things, and you know, we sometimes get it right and we sometimes get it wrong, and you know, we've seen some you know, really remarkable um, uh, events in the in the Jewish world. Uh, I want to leave that value neutral. I don't want to say advances or retreats. Some will see it positively, some will see it negatively. But in terms of of women's of women's uh, role, women as educators, women as women as uh, you know, I daren't Go say on. the word clergy, but uh, but but women functioning in some kind of leadership role uh, yeah. that the outside world would certainly identify as a clergy uh, a clergy function, um, even if they're not you know fully able because of certain halachic limitations um, to lead the service or read the Torah. Uh, but even there, you know, there have been all types of uh, uh, developments. Um, Rabbi Sachs, you've done too much in your life uh, that we don't have enough time to get to cover everything. So, yeah. so I'm going to cut you off and I want to talk about agnon and tradition. So let's try to figure it out. How on earth did you become one of the foremost experts in the world on Agnon, who is he? What's the story with him? Mm -hmm. uh, winning Nobel Prize. Tell us a little from bit about Buchach. that. From Buchach. Rabbi Agnon is from Bu born in Buchach, where Avi's family and where Avi's, my Avi's, and, okay. and my wife's and my wife's family. And also I want to throw it in there yeah. in case it's not mentioned. I believe lifelong, lifelong vegetarian. He wasn't a light, he was a longtime vegetarian. Long time uh, vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. Agnon indeed was a longtime vegetarian. Uh, Agnon was from a little town called Buchach, where unless your wife or your grandfather was from, you'd never heard of it. Uh, even, even when traveling around Ukraine, most people haven't heard of it. Um, it's a little town in what today is Western Ukraine, but before the partition of Poland at the end of the 19th, at the end of the 18th century was part of Southern Poland. But from the end of the 18th century until World War I was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, part of Galicia, this region which kept uh, shifting you know, its borders kept shifting between Poland and Austria and back to Poland. And then, you know, of course, today, as I said, uh, Ukraine. Um, it's not terribly far from Lviv. Uh, little town, when Agnon lives there, they're about, at the end of the 19th century, there are about uh, 12,000 uh, residents, about 60% of whom were Jewish. It's not a shtetl. It's not a village. It's a town, but it's a small town. Uh, he's born in 1887, although he always claimed he was born on Tisha B'Av, 1888, this very significant date in the, in the Jewish calendar, Tisha B'Av, uh, the day uh, that marks the destruction of the Jerusalem temples. Uh, and from an early age, uh, from a, as an early teenager, he's uh, recognized as a great literary talent. He starts writing and publishing first poetry, uh, and then he realizes that his talent is in prose, not in poetry, first in Yiddish, and then he makes the move to, to Hebrew. At the, around the age of 20, in 1908, he leaves Buchach, he leaves Galicia, and he comes an Aliyah, and he settles in Jaffa, uh, where he becomes this, you know, young rising star 
in the firmament of the new Hebrew literature. Remember, of course, part of the Jewish people's great achievement in the land of Israel was the reawakening of the Hebrew language as a modern language. And there was a debate about, well, what should Hebrew literature be? That's if all we do is take Anna Karenina or Don Quixote and translate them into Hebrew, that does not ipso facto make them works of Hebrew literature, and it certainly doesn't make them works of Jewish literature. They are Russian or Spanish novels in translation. We all know what translation is. And if we were going to reawaken ourselves as a nation, we were going to have to produce our own literature. We'd have to produce our own art. We'd have to produce our own philosophy. And these were parts of the achievements of of the Jewish settlement in those in those years. The young Rav Kook, who is the rabbi of Jaffa in this uh, time, the great uh, sainted rabbi Abraham Isaac Cohen Cook, recognizes in the young Agnon, who, whose name was not yet Agnon. Agnon was a pen name he adopts. His name was Chachkis, Shmuel Yosef Chachkis. Um, he recognizes in him as exactly the kind of talent that he, he thinks that we need. Somebody that's going to take the entirety of the Jewish corpus of, of writing, all these books behind me, from the Bible, through the rabbinic literature, the Midrash, the Mishnah, uh, the works of Chazal, the works of medieval Hebrew, Hebrew writing, medieval Hebrew poetry, Hasidic literature, the works of the Haskai. He's going to take it all and distill it and pour it into the mold of modern literature. And, uh, and that's what Agnon, Agnon did. There was a, a period of a number of years where he left Israel and goes to Germany. He gets stuck in Germany during World War I, exactly as Rav Kook was stuck in Europe during World War I. While he's there, he meets the woman who becomes his wife. They have two children. He meets the great uh, German-Jewish philanthropist uh, Shlomo Zalman Shoken, who was you know, the financier of much of, the, much of Jewish life in Germany at that time, and Shokin becomes his patron. That's why Agnon's writings until today are copyright to the Shokin, the Shokin press here in, in Israel. Um, and because of that, Agnon was able to dedicate himself fully to his craft uh, uh, and not have to you know, find uh, an income on the side. In 1924, he returns to Jerusalem, and basically all he does is sit and write. He didn't act as a kind of public intellectual. He wasn't running and doing other things. And because of that, he had this very prodigious career. He, uh, he, he was active into his, into his 80s and really until the last year of his life, he continued, he continued writing. Today, the collected writings, some of which were only published posthumously, number 23 large uh, volumes. And in 1966, the, the telegram came to announce that he had won the Nobel Prize. Hebrew literature's only a Nobel laureate. There are, of course, many great Jewish authors that have that have won the Nobel, even some for writing very distinctly Jewish literature. Years later, Saul Bellow writing in English, and then Isaac Bashevis Singer writing in Yiddish. Uh, but Agnon is the only Hebrew laureate. At the time, he was the first Israeli to win the Nobel in any category. And now we have, we have many Nobel laureates in the sciences, in economics, in uh, chemistry, and even, uh, I think, four Nobel Peace Prizes, which is kind of ironic since that's the one achievement that truly uh, still evades us. Um, and uh, Agnon's writing becomes the kind of high watermark of modern Hebrew literature. It has cast a long shadow over Hebrew letters until this, until this day. All contemporary Hebrew writers kind of wrestle with his, his influence. But for our purposes, for our conversation, his writing is the most profoundly modern but also the most deeply Jewish writing there is. Both his Jeff, stories- how did you, get, how'd you world, get into him? How did I get into him? Well, we don't have enough time for that, <laughs> but the short answer is- The short <laughs> the, answer the, is- the, second answer. The, the very short answer is that it, when I was in high school, when I was becoming observant, one of my grandmothers who I mentioned, who was, as I said, not very Jewishly observant, but a very, very, uh, a very educated and cultured woman. If a, a, a Hebrew author uh, sitting in Jerusalem won the Nobel Prize, she would have taken note. And she bought me a copy of what was then called, I'm looking for it on my shelf. Uh, here you go, here it is. A copy of a book called 21 Stories. 
Yeah. It was a collection. When he won the Nobel, the publisher quickly took all of the existing short stories and translation that had appeared in Commentary magazine, in, in this Jewish newspaper here and there, and they slapped them between two covers. Uh, I don't know if I had heard. I must have heard of Agnon before that. I was a quite bookish kid um, in, in high school. I don't think I had read anything by him, and I certainly could not have read him then in Hebrew. And even had I been able to read him in Hebrew, all of his thousands of intertextual references to the Jewish canon would have been lost on me because I wasn't fluent in those in those sources. Uh, but but nevertheless, I I understood. You know, in, in that regard, Agnon's work is also is almost pseudo midrashic because it's a modern text which stands on its own but it's engaging with all of the great Jewish classics that come before us. But nevertheless, I understood he was saying something really profound about the modern Jewish condition and all types of questions that, you know, as I said, when you asked me about my own biography, questions that I was asking myself about the relationship between tradition and modernity, between, between a world of faith and a world of, a world of doubt and ways to kind of build a bridge between them. And it spoke to me and I continued reading him in translation. And then when I came on Aliyah, I tried to read him in Hebrew, but my Hebrew wasn't yet good enough. Um, so I continued reading in translation. Uh, and then at a certain point I made the switch and I had, you know, it was like just one of those weird things where I had realized that I had read much of his writing. And I, I just got this idea in my head one day that I could read, you could do the whole thing. You could read all of Agnon, all 23 volumes, uh, you know, beginning to end. And like all of those immersion projects, you know, like the woman who cooked every recipe in the Julia Child cookbook, or, you know, people who daf, do daf yomi and learn every page of the Talmud, it becomes this kind of obsession. And then it becomes a lens through which you learn a lot about the subject matter that you're focusing on, but then it becomes a lens to look back on yourself and learn something about yourself. And then the real short answer is, I had the opportunity to start teaching Agnon's writings, and only through teaching something do you truly become expert in it. And yeah, then I fell into this it, position here at the Agnon House in in Jerusalem. What, what what did it mean in 1966? I mean, I know you weren't you weren't not, none of us were around, but maybe you, you. I'm sure you understand. What did it mean for for Israel, for yeah. Israelis, for the idea of uh, this nation, which was at that point 18 years old, uh, having a having a Nobel laureate in in its in in Hebrew. What did it mean for Israeli literature? I mean, what, well, by the way, it wasn't just for it. Israel. It was for the whole Jewish world, right? Yeah. It, you you can read uh, reports, you know, in newspaper reports and and other things and and speeches. Uh, I know that uh, Avi and I sometimes speak about the 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 late and lamented Rabbi Norman Lamb, uh, who was the president of Yeshiva University, but was also at that time. Uh, the rabbi of the Jewish Center, major Manhattan synagogue, and you can read his uh, sermon uh, about about Agna, what it meant, you know, to to parishioners in Manhattan that this Hebrew author in Jerusalem had won had won the Nobel. It was a source of great pride for the Jewish people worldwide, um, and it was also it was taken as a as a mark of the achievement of the Hebrew language this revived language in 1966, how many native Hebrew speakers were there in the world? A small fraction. Three million maybe? No, in other words, all of the people living in Israel, the majority of them were not oh, true. Hebrew as a first language, right. right? In other words, you know, so many of the Hebrew speakers were Hebrew speakers as a second language. Agnon himself was right. Hebrew, was his second language. His native tongue, his birth tongue was was Yiddish, um, and probably would have been his fourth or fifth language if you think about it. Actually, no, it, it would have been his second no. language. Agnon, Agnon really only had fluency in Yiddish and in Hebrew. Did he speak he, Polish? He, no, he, he couldn't speak Polish because it, by that time he was not in Poland. He was in he was in Austria. In other words, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is is in control. He 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 had a pretty good working knowledge of German. He could speak German and he could read German, but uh, but he probably could not speak too much Polish. Huh. Uh, Jeff, you, met, you mentioned Rabbi Norman Lamb, which is a perfect segue into your current position, which is uh, no small feat, considering have there been more than four or five editors of tradition in its history? Yeah, I think I'm the fifth, I think, the yeah. Fifth editor of tradition, Rabbi Norman Lamb, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, started 60, 64 years ago. 
He's, he starts a journal of intellectual Jewish thought and it becomes the mainstay. I mean, who didn't get their copy of the tradition for many, many decades? And he was the editor. There you go. Now you can get and, your copy. And it was always like these great intellectuals, leaders, rabbis, thinkers who are, uh, you know, who are teaching us about uh, what, what's going on in the Jewish world and what's happening and what are we thinking. And now it's Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs. You must be honored and humbled and, and uh, what's that experience like? Yeah, well, certainly when I took the position, all of that history and the, the people who had filled the role before me was a very daunting idea because, you know, like you, I grew up, uh, you know, with the idea, you know, I remember like the first flickering aspiration that I might be able to write something that would be published in, in tradition oh, was, was, a, was a great aspiration. Uh, but the idea that I would be the editor was uh, almost inconceivable. Um, uh, tradition is a very important uh, platform within the modern Orthodox world, but also on the peripheries into neighboring intellectual and spiritual communities. I'm always delighted to discover people both to our right and to our left who are engaging with what we're with what we're writing. And we've you know tried to do a lot. I always say, you know, scholarly journals are not you know by nature cutting edge uh, you know institutions. We don't put electric uh, neon lime green on the cover. Um, uh, you know, there's something deliberately stodgy about a scholarly journal. Uh, but nevertheless, we, to be relevant today, we had to bring it into the late 20th century at least. So we're doing so much more uh, things around the margins of the journal, which is still the heart of what we do, this quarterly print journal. Uh, delivered, you know, to your home mailbox on a pile of dead tree. Uh, but we're doing podcasting and Facebook, and we're publishing digital content directly to the to the website, uh, you know, a few times a week. Because if all you're doing is putting out a quarterly print journal, you know, four times a year, you're not that relevant to the ongoing conversation. The old days where a journal would appear in the winter, and then in the spring, somebody would publish a letter to the editor about something that somebody had written in the issue before or two issues before that. And then in the summer, the author would respond to the person who wrote that has gone out with the Pony Express. And we're trying to move all of that over to the digital platforms and to try to, you know, be meaningful in the life of a religious community to give people challenging things to, to think about. Uh, both in terms of, of, of learning, of Torah study, but also in terms of the, the sets of Jewish ideas that we have to be engaged with. This plays back to what we said a few minutes ago about modern orthodoxy really setting a high bar for, for intellectual engagement. And what tradition, the, I guess, uh, is the workshop that tries to put some of those ideas out. What, 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 are, what are the cutting edge things, like what's in the most recent uh, editions? What's on the cutting edge of intellectual thought in the modern Orthodox world? Well, I'm always amazed. We're finishing up our upcoming issue right now. As you know, right before I dialed into the conversation, we were doing the final proof on our upcoming winter issue that'll be out in a few weeks. And it's just such a very varied. I'm I'm so pleased with you know how how varied it is. There aren't I don't think there are too many other journals that would put out an issue that has so many different things. An article on education. Uh, on moral education in, 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 in Jewish life, an article on um, uh, the, uh, the allocation of scarce resources during Corona from a halachic perspective, uh, book reviews of some important scholarship that's going on, you know, which is a very important way to, very important way to, you know, to, to push ideas further. You know, somebody publishes a book, uh, you know, it has a limited scope, but through a kind of review essay, right, it's able to put a spotlight on the work of other scholars and to, and to jumpstart it. So there's a particular book about women's education in, uh, in, in your neck of the woods about, uh, there's a scholar named, uh, named uh, uh, Rachel Manikin uh, from uh, the University of Maryland, who's been doing for many years work on young girls' religious Jewish experiences, particularly women's Jewish education, and the lack of it, 
and what happened with the arrival of the Beit Yaakov movement, which we now think of as being this, you know, kind of right wing thing. But at the time was, uh, you know, this liberal, uh, radical idea that we were going to educate young women. Uh, but what happened to the women that weren't educated and didn't have those opportunities? Every, you see how everything ties together, all of the different parts of our conversation. Um, nice. And, you know, these kinds of, uh, you know, Jewish girl runaways who ran away to convents, who ran away to, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to get education, uh, all types of things. And this is a book, a work of scholarship, but it has profound meaning for our lives in religious communities today. And it plays into those questions of gender differences and gender roles and things like that. So we have uh, Dr. Beverly Gribbets, who's you know this leading, uh, very significant uh, figure in in uh, girls' education here in Jerusalem, reviewing the book as a scholarly work, but also trying to tease out the implications for well, what does this mean for our work, our work today? That's the kind of 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 uh, of conversation that we're trying to generate to move from the world of kind of the, the academy, uh, the philosophical, the historical too, actual meaning for lived religious life and, and practice. So those are some of those things. As you know, we recently put out a very large uh, special edition of tradition in memory of, of Rabbi Lamb, who, who was the founding editor of tradition, which I think is a very significant uh, contribution. It'll be an enduring contribution to Jewish scholarship because we took Rabbi Lamb's vast array of you know, his own written record on a huge variety of topics in Jewish life and learning and literature and thought. And we assigned his writings to 35 of the leading uh, rabbis and philosophers and professors and communal leaders uh, you know, of our day to write about Rabbi Lamb's writings. Uh, so together it kind of creates a kind of reader's guide to, to what Rabbi Lamb had, uh, had done. Uh, so I'm particularly proud of that uh, that particular contribution. I would is you know suggest your readers visit us at traditiononline.org to see what we're doing. You, know, you can sample you know our archives going back to 1958, our open access, um, but also the, the kind of ongoing digital content that we're doing online. Um, I enjoy your podcast and, very much as well. Very very. Yeah. I will check. I will, I will check it out. Rabbi, we uh, thank you. This has been fascinating. I, I wish that uh, I feel like we could. I, I should that. also I should also mention we didn't really talk about uh, what actually is my day job, running an organization called the WebYeshiva.org, and that was actually what first brought me uh, to Poland, because we have very many students in Poland who study with us online. We were the very first, long before the rest of the world discovered Zoom, uh, during the past uh, two years, uh, we were the very first uh, and still the best online interactive. Uh, Jewish learning platform with synchronous ongoing learning uh, all throughout the week. And of course, an archive of th now thousands of hours of classes and courses in Shurim, uh, including some in Polish, um, but mostly in English. And uh, you can visit us at webyeshiva.org uh, to, to see all of our courses, almost all of which are, are free. Rabbi yeah. Sachs, too, too much to discuss, too many uh, things that you're doing which are remarkable. We should only continue to have much success in it. Much, much, much that's You make Thank me you feel both. very you make me feel very lazy. No, I I I see your Facebook feed, Jonathan. You're plenty busy. And you're doing you're you're both doing great work in, in Krakow. And we all, you know, should be paying attention to to the historical work that you guys are doing. I hope to get to you soon to see you again. We hope to see you soon. We have the a couple important of questions. Questions. Yeah, go, Jonathan. Go ahead, Rabbi. No, you, you, it's your thing. You got to do it. It's not a podcast. It's not AMA until you do this. We, we have a couple of questions that we always end with. One is, are you on Team Latka or Team Hamantash? Oh, I'm at the moment, I'm on Team Diet. I've, I've uh, finally gotten control. I don't look like you. you. You look like a scarecrow, Jonathan. You always look like you just ran a marathon. Uh, <laughs> so at, at the moment, I'm on Team, uh, team Iceberg Lettuce. But, you know, we forced you. Like a latka. I mean... Latkes are fried. Fried food is you can fry shoe leather and it would taste good. There we go. And then you put that schmaltz, you put the cream, the sour cream on top. What's bad? A hearty endorsement for latkes. And 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 Jeff, your your three favorite films of all time. My three favorite films. Hmm. Well, I mean, number one, I would have to say it depends on how you count, but I'd have to say The Godfather. And by The Godfather, I mean, I yeah, mean one, one and two. two. You mean one and, and two? Let's. I count that as one. One. As you. 
as any civilized man would. You made it to the top, the all stars of uh, AMA, just by saying that. Godfather, what else? Well, hold and, on. Uh, and I have this kind of like a romantic, nostalgic connection to Casablanca. Excellent. And uh, then I would say uh, the Marx Brothers, both because of their enduring, their enduring, um, you know, just their 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 enduring humor. Um, but also because, you know, sometimes the things that become your favorite, like, you know, your favorite book, um, is not because of the virtues of the book per se, but because it, it connects to a certain moment, you know, that you encountered it. Um, so, you know, like that memory of like, you know, watching the Marx Brothers uh, with my dad, and then the pleasure of watching it with my kids and watching how the humor can... Um, can colonize a young person's mind. Like when you when you see like a kid's sense of humor developing, and when you realize when they when they understand why Groucho is funny, when they understand just like like that 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 realization that there's just something funny about the way the man walks, right? And they can't explain it. They don't know why. And so there's just something delightful about using the Marx Brothers, you know, uh, as a lens to watch your own kid's sense of humor develop, so that you can then think something about yourself and. Uh, was it. that three? Did I say three? That was good. That was excellent. Well thought out. Well yeah. presented. Well argued. We accept all three and and like like the answer. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, be well. We hope to see you again soon. Thank hope you for taking the time. Bye. See you Thanks next so Shabbos. Bye bye. Yeah.